Welcome back to another episode of Accelerate the Great. I'm your host, Nehemiah Davis. And listen, I told you guys, we not playing with season two. I'm bringing the big hitters on season two. I'm bringing on game changers on season two. I'm bringing on some of your favorite internet entrepreneurs, some of your favorite investors. And we're going to make sure we change lives and give keys to help people build generational wealth and create money, literally, literally create money, right? So one of our number one requested episodes to bring back for a part two uh, was Doug Depp. So I said, man, let me, he's in town. Let me bring him back on the podcast so he can spit some more of that real estate talk to everybody on here. So without further ado, I hope you guys hold, get a pen, get a piece of paper, because on this podcast, I'm about to dig in and uh, get a whole lot of questions answered pertaining to real estate to further help you build generational wealth, right? So without further ado, welcome back once again to Accelerate the Great. Let's get to it. Doug, that what it do, my guy? Hey, man, I'm just happy to be here. Thanks for having me, man. I'm just so excited for this episode. Let's get it. Hey, let's just another uh, beautiful day. So listen, <laughs> man, um, we talk about it often. We talk about how real estate is the number one subscription business in the world. We were walking around um, and we was just analyzing a bunch of buildings and we realized that all of them were paying rent or owned by somebody who was generating income. So why should people get into real estate now? Should they wait? Because I, I hear a lot of times people say, "Is should I be waiting? When is the perfect time to get started in real estate? Yo, listen, listen, the time is now. No matter what people tell you, no matter if the economy's up, down, sideways, it doesn't matter. Now's the time to get into real estate simply because everyone needs a place to live, right? That's been proven ever since, you know, the early biblical days, right? Everyone right. needs food and shelter. Yep. So if you could be in that position to provide people with shelter and be in that number one subscription business in the world, why not be in it? Right. right. So I know on our last podcast, we touched on your story. I don't want to spend too much time going back on it, but how important is it having the right people in the corner? If, if you listen to the last podcast, Doug gave his old girlfriend a two weeks notice because she wasn't down with the vision. She was okay with being poor. Mm. So how important is it to have the right people in your vision? And how do you convince your wife, your husband, your spouse, or other people around you to get on the, 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 the mindset of building wealth and buying real estate? Like if they've never done it before, how do you – I heard you talk about how Janice and Aaron, yeah. she didn't, uh, he didn't, she didn't want him to do your ride along, and she ended up letting him do it, and now she's more in the real estate than him. And they, yeah. in the last year, they bought five or six properties. So, yeah. how do you convince somebody who's never done it before, like, yeah. yo, this is what we need to be doing? Hey, listen, I think what it comes down to is cause I see far too often couples, you know, one cu one uh, couple would go ahead and bring it to their spouse, and they say, you know what, I want to get into real estate. Great. But then they don't see any action. They go back, you know, from working the nine to five, they go sit on the couch and they watch LeBron work, right? They watch Kobe Bryant or whoever is working, right? They watch these TV shows, Power, what have you. But they don't put any action toward that goal that just told, told their spouse. So imagine if I would have told my wife, Larissa, hey, I want to get into real estate. But after I came home from that nine to five, from hugging that cubicle, I'm going to my, I'm going to my uh, you know, couch and just watching TV. Right. She's not going to believe in the dream if I'm not putting that action, putting that hard work toward getting to what it is that I'm looking to get to. So if it's real estate, I need to be looking at properties. I need to be research. I need to be making calls. Right. So you have to lead with the work. You have to lead with the action. You know, talk is cheap, as the saying goes. Right. So often people just want to talk about their dreams, talk about what they're going to get, what they're going to do. Mm. Right. But you need to show you need to show, not tell. Mm. Mm. You know, it's so funny on my uh if you're listening to this right now, you you're probably gonna hear, y'all. I'm releasing my first album. No, I'm not a rapper. No, I'm not an athlete. No one even no one even knows about this yet. But yeah. on one of the tracks, I just talk about my grandma, and mm. and I'm super pumped up to release release my first motivational uh, album. It's gonna be crazy. But what what's so crazy to me is. Um, my grandma, I loved her more than anybody in the world, right? God rest her soul. She passed away a little less than a year ago. I've been to 55 countries, y'all. But prior to that, my grandma will always tell me, son, don't go there. It's dangerous. Son, don't do that. Um, don't travel. Don't do this. You shouldn't go to Mexico. I heard it's bad. And the problem with so many people is they end up listening to their mom, their husband, their grandma, their spouse, like I almost did. And guess what? I would have deprived myself to going to 55 countries. 
Right now, I got a business in Philippines with 20 staff members in Philippines, and I wouldn't have had that business right now if I would have never went to Philippines, right? Wow. Wow. That's You know, we got That's a whole crazy. automated business there right. that I wouldn't even have had right now if I wouldn't have went. I wouldn't have went to Dubai. I wouldn't have rode a camel. I wouldn't have went swimming with whale sharks. I wouldn't have pet lions in Africa uh, pet tigers in Thailand, like some of the most incredible experiences I ever had in my life resulted in me getting on a plane, getting uncomfortable mm. and doing something new. Right. So there's a lot of people right now is going to try to talk you out of whatever your goals may be. And oftentimes you listen. But what you got to start asking yourself is, is this individual who's giving me this advice? Right. Do they do what I'm looking to do? Right. You know how many times I hear in real estate, bro, don't rent the Section 8 is bad. Oh man, listen, listen. How many times have you heard that, bro? And they hey, and hey, when I was he when, say she say stories. Crazy, crazy. When I was getting started, that was the number one thing. They're gonna tear up your property, right? That's what insurance is for. That's what screening tenants is for, right? Mm. Oh, they're not gonna pay you. That's why you have different agencies you can tap into. You can tap into veterans. You can tap into homeless uh, housing, right? You can tap into Section Eight and get your paycheck every thirty days. But a lot of times, like you said, people are just listening to people that haven't been where you're trying to go. So when it comes to, you know, looking at your goals and where you're trying to go, you have to listen to people that have been there before, right? Because oftentimes it's the people that are close to us. They just want to protect us. So people often go to their, their mom, their dad, and ask for advice, right? But their mom or dad might not have any idea. They might have been hugging that cubicle to that 67 and a half mark, right? So how are you going to talk about entrepreneurship, real estate, and freedom and mobility with someone that doesn't currently have their freedom and mobility? Wow. Woo, that's heavy. I always tell people this, like, yo, you want to be an entrepreneur? Don't go asking your coworker if it's a good idea. It will never be a good idea, yeah. especially to someone who operates with a scarcity mindset. Mm. We've been conditioned so far along to operate with scarcity. We don't think about abundance. We don't think about what's possible. We don't think about where we could go. So what we end up doing is we end up staying exactly where we are instead of us living our life, right? And I tell people this, I need anyone listening to understand this. This ain't no rehearsal. Some people are under the impression that I think you get to come back and try this life thing again. Right, get a second chance. No. There are no second chances. No, you listen. <laughs> so if you're listening to this, you better start living your life up right now. So look, we were talking about the other day, we were talking literally about um, what most people don't understand. And, and I don't think, you got to get a real taste of freedom and mobility to really see what it what it feels like. Oh man. It ain't even about money at this point. No, the no. freedom and mobility of being able to get up and go. Hey, tomorrow we got to go to Mexico. All right, bet. We out. Gone. We out. That that no, no you question. can't you can't put a price on that, right? So, what I wanted to uh you you can't put a price on that. So the first thing I need you guys to identify and we talked about this. A lot of you or people in general, I want to make 10K a month. I want to make 20K. I want to make 150, 30, whatever the number is. Your first goal should be making enough to replace your job income. Right. So I want you to talk about two things. I want you to talk about, you know, the four by four, the, the play where yeah. before you get married to help somebody go ahead and get financially free. Because we understand the two things that separates most marriages are finances and infidelity. So yep. if you can eliminate the finances yeah. piece... Man, so I wanted you to I wanted yeah. you to quickly talk about how somebody could get free and then yeah. getting your freedom back. Yeah. You always talk about that freedom number. Yeah. So yeah. what is that? Talk a little bit about that. So so let's go ahead and talk about the triple four, I call it, right? So the triple four is for those people that have a significant other it might not be married yet, right? So there's a program called the FHA loan program where you only have to put three and a half percent down. So three and a half percent of the total loan amount, the purchase price of the property, you put that down. You can buy anywhere between a single family unit all the way up to a four unit building. So let's say you go ahead and you purchase that four unit building. You live in one of the units. You rent out the other three. You live for free, right? But now your significant other, what if they go ahead and use that same FHA program and purchase themselves a four unit building? So now they put down three and a half percent. They're also living for free and they have three, three other tenants, right, in that same building. So now combined, you guys have four plus four eight units all together. But then guess what happens when you go ahead and get married? Take that next step. You guys can go ahead and get another FHA loan because your situation has changed. Your situation has changed, so now you go to the, the lender, say, hey, I need another FHA loan, put your 3.5% down, grab another fourplex, right? 
might have to be uncomfortable, might be in a two-bedroom apartment while you're just getting started, right? But now, if you're able to make this sacrifice and this commitment, you'll be in a situation to go ahead and have 12 units combined. So I call that the triple four play. So that's why it's so important to have, be on board with someone that's willing to take that leap with you, take those steps, because it's very simple. Once you cover your overhead, and you know the biggest people's overhead is a place to live, right? Next is going to be food, car expense, and if they have any college debt. But this is going to help you guys get out of debt a lot sooner, and it's going to help you live in a situation where you can take that extra savings and that extra money. The key is don't go ahead and increase your lifestyle, increase your spending, because you'll be in a situation where you have to hug that cubicle, right? The idea is to not have to hug that cubicle till you're 67 and a half and get out of the rat race as soon as, po as possible because that's going to allow you to, to uh, grab your passion that much sooner, right? And uh, if you like working a nine to five, great. But once you have a taste of that freedom, there's nothing else like it, right? Where you can wake up, you can make your own hours, you can work when you want to work, collect your rent checks, and keep it moving. But that's that triple four play that everyone needs to tap into. How soon can they do this play? They can do that play right now. Hmm. What what's some things they need? What is that? Two they need uh they need two, two years tax returns. Two years tax returns, three months w, bank statements. A, a w, w two, uh, two months of bank statements, at least a five eighty credit score to put three and a half percent down. But there's some people like, oh, my credit is bad. Yo, you can have you can have a five hundred to five seventy nine credit score, and instead of putting three and a half percent down, you can still run the same play, but you have to put down ten percent. Right, so there, so no no longer people should be able to use. I don't have credit, mm. right? Even at the low credit at five hundred, five twenty, you can still get into the game. But the name is to live for free. Once you're able to live for free, once I was able to live for free, things started to change. I started to increase my my cash flow on a monthly basis, so then I could dump that extra cash flow right and back into more investment assets. Yeah. Right, that's the mindset we have to have. So how do you develop that mindset? You 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 from the hood. Right. You from a hood. You you've been watching your friends around you blow money on clothes, blow yep. money on depreciation, depreciating assets. Mm -hmm. They have never made any investments. But now you want to have some sort of life change. How what, what would you tell somebody who's trying to switch their mindset from spending all of their money on right. liabilities to trying to move the assets? Yeah. How do you tell somebody how do you start saving more money to buy more investments? What, what would you tell that individual who'd be like, man, I, because they're around people who like yeah. who's not possibly encouraging them to do better. Yeah. They're around people like, yo, let's go buy the Chanel bag. Let's mm -hmm. go, let's go buy the uh, the Balenciagas yeah. for the stack. You yeah. know? So yeah. what do you tell people? I think what people have to do is they have to read books, right? And you have to start to eliminate some of your friends, eliminate some of your circle. So basically, your friends can either take you up or take you down. So you have to be open to knowing. Hey, is this person in my life taking me up or if they're taking me down? But I would definitely recommend the book that my dad gave me back when I was in seventh grade called The Richest Man in Babylon. And that book talks, talks to you about how to respect money. And once you're able to respect money and know that money is a tool to go ahead and make you more money, to buy you more freedom, buy you more things, then that's when you start to respect money. But I think it really just comes down to the fact that you have to understand how money works. Once you understand how money works, and then it's like, okay, I could put $1,000 on these Balenciagas, or I know that I only need $8,000 to buy a house, so why don't I put this $1,000 away in the account, and then I just need $7,000 more, then I could buy my next asset. But I won't be fresh, though, bro. People want to be, what about being fresh? Hey, listen, you got to put you got put being fresh on hold. <laughs> you just got to put it on hold. Like, do you want to be fresh and broke? Mm. Like, you know, and hugging that cubicle to your six, seven and a half? Or do you want to have your financial freedom a lot sooner at 30 years old? And then after 30 and so forth, if you have all this extra surplus of cash flow, go ahead and get fresh then. Yeah. But being fresh has to be delayed. Mm. You know, another thing, I'll, I'll be telling people this. You know how I, how I used to calculate my purchases, and I think this is good for somebody. Yeah. How I want you to begin to calculate your purchases. Don't look at Balenciagas as a 1000 Right. I want you to look at it as... However much you make an hour. So I make I'm not a mathematician, so I'm gonna say it's five twenties in in a in a hundred. So that means I wanna say that's it's fifty fifty hours. So if you make twenty dollars an hour, 
and you're going to go buy a pair of sneaks for a thousand. Yep. You didn't pay a thousand. You just gave fifty hours to purchase this product. Fifty hours of your life. Of your life that you can't get back. Nope. So you got to really start asking yourself: Is this purchase? Worth 50 hours. Now, granted, guys, and, and I ain't going to be – for years, I've never bought anything designer forever. This might be my first year actually yeah. buying designer. Yeah. Right? But when I buy it, it, it don't – it doesn't affect me. It's not like, oh, crap, I got to think about it where, oh, crap, that yeah. cost me 50 hours. Yeah. My last job, $1,500 a month, Listen. I just gave away my entire month to do that. And I was the mm. guy who was buying the True Religion jeans. Yeah. I was the guy buying the Rockin' Republics. I was charging them on my grandma Nordstrom credit card, mm. taking two years to pay for them. I paid double for the jeans with interest. Jeez. And that's what our community do oftentimes. We spend so much money on getting fresh yep. that, it, and not only getting fresh, also when it comes to Christmas. And I don't even want to hurt nobody's feelings, right, but on our right. podcast, I'm making sure I'm helping people become wealthy. Every year what happens, we buy our kids everything that they need. Mm. We got them the freshest. Like, they all of that. They yep. got all the toys. Like, they laid yeah. out. Yeah. And then the next 30 days, and, and I know. All of them toys that you bought, they thrown under the bed somewhere, they're in the basement nowhere. So what you just did, you worked that entire month to provide that Christmas. Now you're in debt for the next year. Now the cycle continues. Mm. I'm trying to make sure that if you listen to this and anybody rock with me, I'm trying to break generational curses. The cycle must end. Poverty must end. Yep. Poor spending habits must end. Not owning assets must end. Not being able to you know, live life on your terms must end. So it's very important if you guys are listening to me, start analyzing your purchases. Will this purchase help me generate more income? Will this purchase help me grow? Will this purchase put me in rooms with people who can make me better? Will this purchase help me level up? And if it will not, I need you guys to go on a, on a diet financially for the next one year and only focus on things that are going to allow you to grow. Only focus on things that are going to allow you to get better. Because that's going to be a major key to you truly leveling up is because, guys, once you get control of your finances, it is game over. You could do anything now because now you are you're financially literate. You know how credit work. And now you're able to just just win. And then, of course, get real estate because it. it ain't going nowhere. Somebody it's say, not. yo, buy the earth because it's not going anywhere. Facts. <laughs> facts, man. Yeah. That financial control is serious. That financial control is serious. And the reason why it's so serious is because, let's say, for instance, as you have that cash flow coming in, if you don't have that financial discipline, that extra $1,000 a month, that extra $5,000 a month, that extra $10,000 a month can easily be spent on foolish things. But it's very important. You know, you're going to see a lot of money in real estate to reinvest the bag, continue to buy more assets. Because every asset that I see is like an actual retirement bucket. Mm. Oh, let's talk about yeah, that. Let's let's yeah, get into that. So yeah. listen, right? I was talking with several people in 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 your pension, ideally. Yep. Your pension. I was talking to one of my mentors, and he was telling me, I was talking to one of my mentors, and he was telling me, man, when I retire, my pension is gonna be like two grand and three grand a a, a month. Mm. So you get two to three grand a month. But before I retire, I got another six, seven years that I got to go put in. So most people are working right now. And, guys, let me be very clear. I'm not talking down on jobs because I got 20, 30 people on my team. I'm not talking down on jobs. Right. Let me be very clear with that. But I, I'm just trying to make you aware of what's possible out here and just trying to give you a, a, a new look on life. So one of my uh, people like, yeah, I'm going to make two to three grand a, a month. You know, but I got to still work another seven years. I'm like, oh, another seven years is mm. something that you hate doing. One, I don't think is worth it. Jeez. But the second thing is most people are saying, hey, fine is good. Here's the 40-40-40 plan. I want you guys to understand this. The 40-40-40 plan is this. Find you a good job. Work the good job for 40 hours a week. Work the good job for the next 40 years of your life because generally when you find a good job, you're around 21, you're around 25. So you work the next 40 years of your life till you're 65. And then they say retire on 40% of your income. Here's the problem with that, Doug. Most people can't retire on 40 on 100% of their income because right. of lack of financial literacy, mm -hmm. right? Yep. So 40% of their income, that's not even a question. Right. So we're working until we're 65 to make sure we're securing Two to three grand a month. I don't even know what a good pension pays, but I don't care if it was four grand a month. 
let's give them a triplex play or a couple property play yeah. to so they can you only need a couple of these to replace your pension. Just let's talk about that as you talk about retirement buckets. Absolutely, absolutely. So uh so let's just talk about one of the properties. So my wife when I when we got before we got married, I didn't have any or my wife didn't have any real estate, I had a bunch of real estate, right? So I said, let's go ahead and get you in the game. So she used her FHA um, loan, which she purchased a 203K FHA loan. And this was a property we picked up for $90,000, right? Construction on this was $60,000. And we could all roll that construction all within that same 203K FHA loan. But this property right here, we lived on the first floor, two bedrooms. And in the middle and the top unit, we rented it out. Uh, $850, $850, right? So we had $1,700 coming in. And the monthly note for that whole property is twelve hundred dollars, so we're able to walk away with about six hundred. What's that? Six hundred dollars a month of cash flow while still living for free, right? We eventually moved out of that apartment, and uh, now we had another thousand dollars coming in. So that's sixteen hundred dollars coming in. But the play is, why not buy a piece of real estate? And as you're renting it out, the tenant is going to pay that mortgage every single month. So the tenant paying that mortgage every single month, you're going to look up in 30 years, and you're, that whole house is going to be paid for. But during that whole 30 years, you've been collecting that extra cash flow, mm -hmm. but then you're going to be at a situation where you own that asset free and clear. With owning that asset free and clear, you have a couple options. You can either sell that asset, right? You can continue to rent it out, and your cash flow is going to be a little bit increased because you no longer have to pay that mortgage as an expense. Or what I would recommend is you refinance that whole house, mm -hmm. put it on another 30-year mortgage, and let's say that property is worth $100,000. So now you just top, tapped in to $75,000 of cash tax-free because they're taking 75%. The bank's going to take 75% of that $100,000 value asset and give you $75,000. Then you just, you know, you're paying that mortgage for another 30 years, but you're not paying it. The tenant is. So it's important to understand how real estate works. And uh, like, for instance, I focus on buying houses in the hood that need to be fixed up. So I'm able to find these properties. We'll get, we could do one, one easy deal uh, in Philadelphia on Uber Street, right? I found it for $27,000 on Craigslist. So I was searching Craigslist. Where you find that? You tell them where you find I'm, them, I'm at. telling them exactly where I'm for Craigslist. Mm. People overlook Craigslist, but mm. there's deals on Craigslist every single day. That's why I wake up at 4.30 in the morning to tap into these deals, mm. right? So I got this deal for $27,000. It was a three. It's a three-story building, but it's zoned as a single family. So I knew that in that area they have tons of multifamily that's worth a lot of money. So I said, you know what? Let me go ahead and get with my attorney, my zoning attorney. We got that property zoned, uh, rezoned as a three-family property, so a three-unit building. And I had to pay seven thousand dollars to go through the whole zoning board. We got approved for a three-unit building, but the so thing you had thirty-four thousand. Yeah, yeah. So yep, so I'm at thirty-four thousand dollars, right? It. Yep. And now, since it's got zoned as a three-unit building, now it's worth $650,000 fixed up. Wow. Right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to construct that building as a, as a three-unit as a, as a three building. I'm going to go ahead and construct that building as a three-unit building, right? So I'm going to go ahead and get some financing, some short-term financing to do the construction on this building. The construction is going to cost me about $250,000. Right, but I'm not. It's not two hundred fifty thousand dollars coming out of my pocket. I'm going to use leverage and get someone else to pay that tab. But however, since I learned how to be my own general contractor, I'm going to actually get that work done for one hundred and seventy-five thousand mm -hmm. dollars. Right. So what that means is that difference between that two hundred fifty that I'm getting from the lender for the construction, and my true cost is one seventy-five. That extra seventy-five thousand dollars is actually going into my pocket as the general contract. That's called a GC fee. Mm. Right, so I'm putting that in my pocket, but now once I finish that property, each floor is going to rent out for about twelve hundred dollars each unit. So that'll be thirty six hundred dollars coming in, right? And keep in mind, you that building's worth six hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So now, since I have a tenant in that in that property, I'll be able to go ahead and take that to the bank at seventy five percent. I can take a loan out for seventy five percent of that value, which is of sixty five. Six hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and it comes out to be about four hundred and eighty seven thousand for the loan. Um, but then I get to put some extra money in my pocket because I only have to pay my short term lender, you know, two hundred and fifty thousand dollars back for that construction that I borrowed. 
So I'll be able to put an additional $100,000 back in my pocket. So all, all together, that, that package, that, that, that building, is putting about $175,000 in my pocket just for finding that property on Craigslist by searching early in the morning, running the play, knowing what to do with the lawyer, getting it rezoned as a triplex, and then constructing that building, now renting it out, and then I'll be able to get some additional cash out surplus, we call it, of an extra $100,000. So, and that's tax free, which is a beautiful thing, is why I love real estate. So it's just being creative and knowing how to analyze, analyze these deals is so important. Because oftentimes people see, or people oftentimes people just want to get into real estate just to get into real estate and say, hey, I got a property. But oftentimes people lose their shirt because they don't know if that's a good deal or a bad deal. What makes something a good deal or a bad deal? Like if somebody right now, man, I'm about to go buy my first property. Yep. And, and you know so many people rush and just go buy something yeah. that don't make sense. Yep. How are you analyzing? If you're telling somebody right now they never analyze the deal yep. and they want to figure out how to analyze the deal, what, what's the steps? Yep. So if you're buying something that's turnkey, ready to go, right? Then let's say you're buying something for uh, $200,000, right? I like something called a 1% rule. So a 1% rule is a nice, quick, easy way to see if you're going to be able to cash flow in a situation like this. So if you're buying something that's turnkey, ready to go for $200,000, and we use the 1% rule, what we're going to do is that $200,000, we're going to multiply that by 1%. That comes out to be $2,000. So this means that the rent on that property needs to come in at $2,000 per month. right? And where do we go to find these rents? We can go to a couple different places. One way is uh, go to rentometer.com. That's rent, R-E-N-T, O, the letter O, and then meter, M E. T-E-R.com, right? You type in that exact address, put in the exact number of bedrooms, and it's going to give you, it's going to spit out what that rent is for that area for where that property is located, right? It's going to give you a median, a high rent, a low rent, so that way you can gauge your calculations right away, and this should only take you about two minutes, right? So that's rentometer.com. There's another source called the Fair Market Rents, right? So you can go right to Google, type in FMR Rents. And what you'll get is you'll get actual, uh, this is the fair market housing that, that's a government site where it'll break everything down by zip code. It'll break it by down by um, a one bedroom, two bedrooms, all the way up to eight bedrooms, and it'll give you what that fair market rent is. So now you can base your calculations off of that number. So you run the 1% rule. So if I was looking at this $200,000 property and the rent is $1,500 in that area, that's a bad deal off the jump. It's not going to cash flow. We're playing this game for cash flow. We don't want to just buy a property and not cash flow. And for those that don't understand what cash flow is, it's where we're taking the, the revenue, which is your rent. We're deducting or subtracting our expenses. Some expenses could be your taxes, your insurance, your maintenance, your vacancies, and also your mortgage, right? So we subtract those expenses. And that cash flow, that number at the bottom, has to be a positive number. And uh, what I like about real estate, it's simple math. You know, if you know how to do addition, you know how to do subtraction, you know, you're ready to invest in real estate. So that's one way, that 1% rule. But then there's another way that I go about bu buying properties that need a little work, right? And this is leveraging the Burr strategy. And for those that don't know, that's where we're buying a property undervalued. We're going to rent that property out. Right? Oh, excuse me, we're going to buy that property undervalued. We're going to rehab that property. Once it's rehabbed, we're going to get it stabilized and we're going to rent it out. Then we're going to refinance that property through a bank. And once we refinance that property through a bank, we're going to get our initial capital back, right? And then we're going to repeat that process. And the reason why I like the Burr strategy is simply because your money does not get depleted this way. So your money is able to continue to cycle and you're able to run it through each and every time you buy an asset. You run the money through, you get that money right back and then some in the surplus. Keep doing that over and over again. But what I use is the 65 percent rule. So let me just break down how the 65 percent rule if I have a little bit of time. So so yeah, with, all right, we cool. try to educate the people. You uh, know, <laughs> Our goal is to help as many people start businesses and buy real estate as possible. That's yeah. why we got the podcast. Yeah, I want to just help people win. So go ahead, break yeah. it down for the people. All right. So the way the 65 percent rule, it works like this, right? So if we're buying something undervalued, we need Say the ARV, that's the after repair value. The after repair value, you need to multiply that by 0.65. So that's 65% of the ARV. So if it's a $100,000 property, once it's fixed up, 
that means that puts us at $65,000. But then on the other side of the equation, so let's just think of an algebraic equation, 0.65 times ARV, which is going to be the ARV number, equals the purchase price plus construction. It's a very, very easy formula. I want to make sure everyone writes this down as listening. All right, so on the one side of the equation, put 0.65 times ARV, right, equals purchase plus construction. So the reason why this is so important, because let's say if we have a property and the purchase price is $20,000, and we know that the construction is coming in at $40,000, right? So that puts us at $60,000. We can solve for where we need the ARV to come in at uh, to be at 0.65. So let's say, for instance, that property is worth $100,000, and you know that the purchase and construction is going to come in at $60,000. That means that we're actually $5,000 below where we uh, – actually, we're $5,000 in the green, so we're in a great position, right? because our maximum is $65,000. So like for instance, that property is $100,000 and once we time that 0 0.65 by 100,000, that means our cap is $65,000. So our purchase and our construction cannot exceed $65,000 no matter what, right? So we have to follow this guideline. I have special calculators that I created so this makes the process a lot easier. Key in these key metrics and it'll spit out for you if it's a good deal or a bad deal, right? We try to keep this as simple as possible, but it's so important even though it's simple, right? So now that you have this uh, ARV at 65%, the reason why we want to keep it at 65% is simply because it's going to allow us to get out of the deal from a standpoint of when it comes time, we fix up that property, right? We get it stabilized, but then we want to get our initial capital back. And the reason why we want to get our initial capital back because there's ways where you can buy this real estate, right? And you can use leverage. You can use short-term funding to take care of the majority of the purchase as well as the construction, 100% of the construction. So, right, so use this short-term funding. Yes, the interest rate's a little bit higher. But when it comes on the back end, once you have that property stabilized, you can go ahead and refinance that property at 75% of the value. That's why we want to be all in at 65%. Because then when we go to refinance it at 75%, we're getting all of our initial capital back, we're paying our short-term lenders back, and we're we should have a cash surplus. So now we start, say if we start off with $10,000, we will end the project maybe with $15,000, right? So we're up some money, and then we can roll that $15,000 into the next property. But we're able to be in a position to receive that additional cash flow. And this is how you truly scale your portfolio by using this strategy right here where you can go from one to a hundred units very quickly simply by just doing this process over and over and over again. And the beautiful thing is you can do this on a single family property, a duplex, a triplex, a quadplex with four units, uh, a five unit building. You can do this same property, same uh, process on a hundred unit building. You can do it on a shopping mall. People all, all the time, they'll buy these shopping malls that are undervalued, right? They'll get them fixed up. They'll get some good anchor tenants, increase their revenue, and then they'll go ahead and um, get it all tenanted up, refinance it. But the refinance, that cash out surplus, might be an extra $10 million, $20 million. You're just dealing with bigger numbers. Mm. But Ooh, and that, yeah. if you don't know, that's the burst strategy. That, that's you just the, basically broke it down yeah, for you. Yeah, that's the burst strategy, and that's one of the phenomenal strategies out here where you can literally scale your business. Because uh, before when I was buying real estate, I was going the old way, where I was basically buying turnkey rentals and um, putting my 20 percent down. And then I would wait about a year, a year and a, a few months to get my initial investment back. But the problem was this with that way was simply because I was you would run out of capital. So I would only be capped at about three properties a year. So I buy three properties and I have to wait a cycle to get those funds back for, before I was able to buy, you know, three more properties. Right. So now with the Burr strategy, I'm able to put down 10% of the purchase price. So if the purchase price is $50,000, I put down 10%, that's $5,000. Yes, there's other closing costs associated with it, so I would probably need about $10,000 put down. But then the lenders that I use will cover 90% of the purchase, the other remaining 90% of the purchase, plus 100% of the construction. So now I'm in a position where I can continue running this play, spread it out over multiple projects, and, get, and be able to scale up that much faster. So now I could do five to seven properties at a time 
run that through the cycle, grab another five, seven properties at a time, and keep running through the cycle. And as I run through the cycle, I'm picking up those assets, picking up that cash flow, which then gives us more freedom and more mobility. So I want everybody to write down if 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 you're if you're cash flowing anywhere from two hundred to four hundred a property, how many of them do you need? How many doors do you need to replace your job income? That's a good equation right there. Mm-hmm. How many doors do you need to replace your job income? If you make a thousand dollars a month and if you're cash flowing three hundred, you need three doors a month. If you're making two thousand dollars a month and you're cash flowing four hundred per door, that's four, eight, twelve, sixteen. 12. You need five doors a month. So basically, just analyze how many you need and start really working and chipping towards that, right? And that's going to get you guys one step closer to becoming financially free through real estate. And the benefit of real estate, I'm gonna be honest with you guys, I'm a little upset, right? Um, we having these conversations about taxes and stuff, and I don't really hear Doug really talking about the taxes. Like I don't, like I'm like, bro, I gotta pay a whole lot of taxes, bro. Like yeah. I'm, and I read something that struck me to the core. Yeah. It said if you weren't about taxes, you don't own enough real estate. I'm talking. I felt that. I'm like, I'm talking about. I fe- it was like a punch in a like Bruce Lee karate kicked me or something. Yeah. I'm like, ooh. So just know my next twelve months, I'm about to really go harder on real estate. Just owner more ownership right yeah um simply because one i want to reduce tax liability 100 percent, but i always think about the family i heard doug say the other night um and i don't know he probably gonna write this in the trust or will right and yeah. it's basically this once you pass down them, the houses to the kids in the rule book you can't sell them number one rule number one rule never sell the bricks and uh, his number one two, his number two rule is always remember the first rule. That's it. That's <laughs> you know it. Yeah. Never. Why is that breaks. important, bro? It's so important because that's your assets, right? That's your, you know, those those bricks, they actually produce cash every single thirty days, right? So that's your generator. That's your engine. That's like having a car and you take out the engine, but you still expect the car to work. Wow. Right. <laughs> so so these houses are your engine. And by you selling the assets, you're eliminating, you're cutting off your earning potential, your income stream, right? Mm. So that's why that's why it's important to never sell the real estate, simply because your family, you can pass the portfolio down to your family, and even if they don't run the business, you can have you know different managers in, in place to run the business, but it's going to be turning out additional cash flow for your family forever, right? And even when people talk about, yo, Doug, why don't you just get into flipping? Why would I flip when I why would I put all that energy into one property, right? I find the property, I negotiate the property, I get the funding for the property, I fix up the property, right? Just to sell it and make a quick couple of dollars. But by the time, say if I was expecting a forty thousand dollar profit, I'd be getting put myself in, in a situation to have to pay capital gains tax, which could be about 30, 40 percent, right? I have to pay the commissions to the realtor which is about 6% of that price, right? I got to pay transfer tax, all this good stuff, so that that, that $40,000 cash out starts to dwindling down to maybe $23,000. Why do that when I could simply run the play and run the play in a situation where I'll be able to get that cash back through the cash out surplus by taking that undervalued property, analyzing that deal correctly, and then go ahead and put a long-term loan on it get my initial investment back, plus additional capital on top of that. So that's the beauty of knowing how to um, play the game of real estate because, again, that cash-out surplus is tax-free. But in addition to, to what Neil was saying, the reason why people that own real estate aren't worried about taxes because the beautiful thing called depreciation. Mm, break it down. All right, so with depreciation, uh, the tax code, this is the U.S. tax code, right? I'm not making it up, where you can take an asset in real estate and you can depreciate that asset. So basically, you take, say you have a million dollar asset, right? You have a million dollars worth of real estate. They, what they do is you divide that by 27 and a half. So you divide that by 27 and a half, right? That's 27 and a half years, okay? So now, what the tax code is saying that you can reduce your taxable income by that amount every year, right? So that's $36,000 every year. So if you make $100,000, you would reduce your taxable income by $36,000. So now you're only paying, let's do the math on that, 
Now you would only be paying taxes on $63,000, even though you just depreciated that other amount, right? But then let's take it a step further for the guys that want to get a little creative and want to accelerate that depreciation. There's something called cost segregation. So now you can go ahead and get in, get that same property that's a million dollars, right? You can hire somebody to analyze and pick apart and do cost segregation for your property. So now what they will be looking at, the heater system. So they say, okay, this heater system is good for four years, and it's valued at $30,000. So instead of spreading that $30,000 over 27 and a half years, they'll spread it over 40 years, right? So now you can deduct $7,500 that year just for your heater systems for the next four years, right? They'll also look at your roof. Like, okay, this roof is good for another five years, and this, is about a, this roof is worth about $100,000 of the property. Now they divide that by five, so that's another $20,000 deduction, right? They're looking at your floors. Uh, these floors are only good for another two years. So and looking at the appliances, there's about $20,000 worth of appliances. They're deducting that down. So that's called the accelerated depreciation, and a good accountant would be able to take that million dollars, and they would basically do that cost segregation and might be able to spread that out over three or four years. So imagine taking a million dollars, dividing that by three, now you're reducing your taxable income by $333,000 each year for the next three years, right? Mm. So if you just if you have a taxable income of $333,000, but you have a million dollars worth of real estate, you do cost segregation, now you just wiped out your tax liability, your tax burden that you would have been paying on that $333,000 of earned income, you'd be wiping it out to zero. Mm. Ooh, that's why I'm so mad I don't own enough real estate. Listen, bro. That's a problem. Listen, if you mm. know, you know. So that's mm. why that's why it's so important that <laughs> it won't happen again. <laughs> right, right. Why is mentorship important, bro? Because <laughs> Hey, listen, mentorship is so important because I've been I've been focusing on real estate actually probably for the fat class. If you count all the years of reading books and just getting ready, it might be 12, 14 years, but actively investing in real estate been about 10 years, right? But during that time, I made so many mistakes because I was learning the hard way. I was I was literally didn't have anyone to really talk to to learn the game with. I was always the trailblazer. So I was the person that I would I would go through with my machete, cut that path passageway, right? But then I would try to pull people through the path so that way they could follow my footsteps. And I tried I mean, I talked about real estate with every single person that I came in contact with. But by having a mentorship you'd be able to have the fast pass. But you talked to a lot of people. Did they take your advice or? Man, probably out of a thousand people that I talked to, maybe about five, if that. One of them Grimes. One of them Grimes. Yeah. And, he, and he did, I think, 250 units in the last three years. Mm. Serious, right? So the thing is with mentorship, you're going to be able to avoid the m many mistakes that I've made along the way, right? But those mistakes made me stronger, but I, I'm the type of person I'd rather, now that I know, I'd rather learn from somebody else's mistakes than having to go through them myself. So by having that mentorship, is getting a fast pass. The other day, um, Larissa and I, we went to Six Flags. We took our little brother to Six Flags, and it was during Fright Night. All was that it cold? It, it was a little chilly. It was <laughs> definitely a little chilly. Yeah, it, I, it, ooh. Yeah, it, yeah it, was, it was the evening time too, right? Got it. But we were waiting in line. And then we noticed there's some people that are just walking right up to the front, hopping right on, going on about their day. Mm. I said, what's going on here? We waiting in line. I only rode two rides, and we were there for four hours. Wow. You rode two rides for four hours. Four right, hours. Right, right. 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 But if I had that fast pass, I am guarantee you I probably could have got about 15 to 20 rides in, in that same amount of time. Mm. So mentorship is like having that fast pass, and not taking on mentorship is like being in that line. And only getting to ride two rides in four year or four hours. But why would I get mentorship if I could figure it out on my own? I could take five years of my life and yep. go figure. I think you you've been actively investing in real estate ten years. You've been doing in this game about twelve. Yeah. So pretty much, you're saying you're able to give me all of your advice, all of your mistakes, everything you went through. Yep. And I'm able to do deals a lot quicker, right? Yep. But there's still people operating with a scarcity mindset. Like, I don't know. I could figure all of this out on my own. Oh, yeah. Oh, what yeah. about what about them people? <laughs> hey, hey, listen, you can go on Google. You can go on uh, YouTube and so forth and try to piece this thing together. Yeah. But believe me, you need some mentorship simply because real estate, you can lose your shirt in real estate. You're yeah. dealing with, you're not just dealing with $100, $50, $10. 
you're dealing with thousands and thousands of dollars, right? You're dealing with loans, you're dealing with credit, you're dealing with banks, right? So you need to know how to play the game, but play the game correctly, because you can be in a situation like I was where I had $100,000 tied up. Tell me about that. So, Because I don't know if most people can withstand what yeah. you had to endure. I hear people talk about they invested three grand and went wrong. They quit entrepreneurship, right, bro. Right, right, You know right. what I mean? So yeah. talk, talk, talk about that. So so at the time, uh, before this this experience, I was buying properties all ready to go, basically turnkey in Coatesville. Just had to put some uh, paint on the walls and um, buying them for $60,000, keeping it moving. But I wanted to take it a next step further. So when I started investing in Philadelphia, I ran into a person. And they sold me a shell. And a shell, for those that don't know, this house was, you walk in the door, all the floor joists are down, falling into the basement, the roof, you could see right through the roof. I mean, it was absolutely crazy. Nothing like I ever seen before, but I'm always about taking calculated risk and taking, and I wanted to get to that next level. So I was like, well, let, let's go ahead and run this play. So I purchased it for $25,000. And the gentleman said, you know, if you got the cash, just go ahead and just, we just go all cash. On this property and I was going against my principles I was like I know I know I'm a financial analyst I know the the value of using leverage and an OPM other people's money I said all right you know I got the money in the account let's go ahead and just give it a whirl because I'm, I'm looking to take that that next adventurous step so I go ahead I buy the property twenty five thousand dollars we get title insurance on it and um, the construction is seventy five thousand dollars for this property now, mind you, that construction budget was extremely low. It was basically new construction for this uh, this property in North Philadelphia. So we go ahead, and uh, the contractor, you know, I'm paying him, paid him some money. He did the demo extremely fast, something like i never, ever seen before. I mean, they had the dumpsters. They're ripping everything out. I was there with my dad, right? So we're ripping everything out, throwing it throwing it in the trash, threw the whole house away in these, in these dumpsters. So then I was like, man, he's rolling, rolling. He's like, hey, hey Doug, we're rolling, we're rolling. We're getting the framing done. So he's like, yo, we need some more money. Boom, I cashed him out. And he's like, yo, yo, we rolling. We got some electric going in. So I, he said, yo, we just need more money. We got to keep these guys rolling, keep these guys rolling. I looked up. The whole $75,000 is basically gone. And we're talking about cash. I mean, I was going, I had to call separate banks because you can only take out but so much money from banks. Like, yo, you, you hitting us like the 5000 We don't have $5,000. Yeah, so I'm yeah, going from bank to bank to bank to put up this these cash deposits to give to this, this man. But, uh. But then things started to slow down once he had the bread. And I was like, yo, what's going on? What's going on with my project? Oh, Doug, yeah, man, you're not going to believe it. You're not going to believe it. You know, it's Big Tank weekend. I said, who the heck is Big Tank? And what does he have to do with my project? Big Tank who? You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, so he said Big Tank who? And then I'm like, next thing I call him, yo, what's going on? Like, there's nothing getting done in my project. The Pope was in town. The Pope, what's the Pope doing in North Philly? Isn't he supposed to be in Italy? Right. So then it's like, oh, it's my birthday. It's my son's birthday, my wife's birthday, my daughter's birthday, my cousin's birthday, my mom's birthday. I'm like, yo, what's going on here? Right. So I literally got to see the whole construction process for two years in slow motion. Right. I'm talking about extremely slow motion. I mean, people are like, man, it's like watching paint dry for years. <laughs> right. <Sorry. laughs> so it's like paint dry for years. So it's a situation where um, I say, you know what? I'm never putting myself in that situation again. I need full control of my projects because I, I'll never have to rely on another man to put my projects together, right? I never want to be put in that situation. It's almost like hugging that cubicle. I never wanted to be in that situation where I got to rely on someone else to get bonuses, someone else to put food on my table, right? Mm -hmm. I'm, you know I'm, what I know, and yeah. I don't want to cut you yeah, off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just want everybody to write this down at some point in time. If you give somebody the ability to feed you, they also have the ability to starve you. Ooh. I want you to really understand. I want you to write that down and let it resonate. If you give somebody the ability to feed you, they also have the ability to starve you. Go ahead. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's powerful right there. So that's that was my main motivation to wanting to be my own contractor because I didn't want to have to be in a situation where you put all this money out and someone just, you got to follow up with them. I mean, I thought about, I was like, man, this guy has $100,000 of mine tied up in this rinky-dink two-bedroom uh, house row home in North Philadelphia, right? So I could have easily folded. I could have easily gave up on real estate completely. I could have easily just walked away and said, hey, that real estate's uh, not for me. I could have walked my tail between my legs and went and just hugged that cubicle for nine to five for dear life for the next 40 years of my life. But I decided not to. I just said, yo, I'm going to keep buying real estate. And uh, I had to find some alternative ways to go about buying real estate. I started getting 
creative and start using credit cards to purchase real estate, balance transfers to purchase real mm. estate. Walk us through that. How you do yeah. that? How you yeah. how you you basically buying a crib with a check? Listen. Yeah. So let me hear that. Yeah. Hear so that so, and you teach I, all of this too. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> I get, I get the game, man. Yeah, go. Listen, because hey, it, I, I gotta say something though, because I, I don't know if people really get. It. I'm gonna keep it all the way real with y'all. Yeah, this is probably our 90th episode. You can't go on my podcast and not get something off of every episode that will drastically change your income and your position if you apply. The problem that I have with people, Doug, is information only changes situations with implementation. They hear it over and over again. You need to own this. You need to do that. But for some reason, we never take action. I hope if you're listening to this podcast as we're transitioning into 2021, right? And if you're listening to it right now, it might be 2021. Make a point, right? And I need you to DM me, right? And, and, And say I promise, Matter of fact, don't DM me because it'll be crazy. Just comment on my Instagram, at Neo DeVee, so I promise I'm going to take action. And I'm going to make this my best year yet because I'm getting tired of hearing people talk about it. You talking about what you're going to do. You keep saying what you're going to do, but you never go out here and make it happen. How many times are you keep waiting? If 2020 didn't teach me anything else, I ain't waiting to do nothing. Nope. You see why I went and bought my dream cars? I said, man, people checking out every day. Listen. If it happened to me, I'm going to be upset that I don't live my life to my full potential. I'm not going to keep living my life uh, not to my full potential. I'm not yeah. going to keep living life as if this is a rehearsal. Mm. So if y'all listening to me, please hear the information that Doug is breaking down to you. Go get in the game. Go buy you a piece of property. Go invest in real estate. Go put something in your kid name. Get them a Do something with this information because, guys, this information, I'm pretty sure it costs thousands and I'm you're getting a whole lot of game right here, but yeah, break oh, yeah. down the balance, uh, yeah. balance. But how yeah. if somebody listening, how can they get mentorship from you? What, what y'all got going on real quick, and then we jump back in. Yeah, 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 for sure, for sure. So what you what you could do is you can go to uh, the real estate wealth book, real estate wealth book dot com. That's mm. a way. Oh, that's that new work. That's that's oh, new yeah. work right yeah. there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, that's my first time even dropping this right here. But uh, that's where you're gonna have the 14 steps to go about acquiring your next investment property, your first or next investment property. But what I also included was the 21 mistakes, right? So the reason why the 21 mistakes is so important because you're going to literally have a list of my top 21 mistakes that I've made. So that way you can avoid these costly mistakes and make your transition to buying that first and next real estate property that much easier because it's almost like you had the roadmap, but it's telling you exactly where the potholes are in the road. So, hey, switch lanes, go to the left lane. There's a huge pothole that can wipe you out, right? So that's that's going to be a beautiful thing. So you can definitely get tap in with that. I also offer on my Instagram at Doug Depth, D-O-U-G-D-E-P-T-E, tons and tons of video content. There's hours, hours. I'll, I'll, I haven't added up all the hours, but it might be almost 10 hours worth of game that you can literally tap into uh, from a real estate standpoint as well as my YouTube. And then there's another one, uh, Execute with Doug, executewithdoug.com, where you can also uh, tap in. But and guys, I'm gonna tell y'all something because yeah. I, I convinced this dude, and I guess um, this will be out at some point. Yeah. I'm like, bro, give a house away. Mm. Oh, you weren't supposed to tell him. I man. know, yeah. I, like, it's so funny, y'all. So I always talk about repurposing and and like always just maxing out your content. So some people right now, you're on Instagram. I'm on Instagram while I'm doing this. So this episode probably won't come out for weeks, um, and all of this stuff that he got together will be done, but. Giving away a crib, y'all. Yeah. Giving away a crib, which is going to be crazy. So I, I'm, I'm looking for. I know it's yeah. supposed to be a little yeah, secret. Yeah, yeah, but um, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna give a house away, man. That's so, gonna be. Somebody needs an asset. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Someone needs that. an asset. Yeah. So, so yeah, yeah, let's go. Let's switch gears, bro. Let's go ahead and talk about the balance uh, transfer play, okay, man. Yeah. Because I know you helped a whole lot of people with that move, and yeah. it, it helped a lot of people able oh, yeah. to. Because they just don't know. If you don't know, you don't know. Hey, listen, listen. So with the balance transfers, I've always been a big component or a big advocate of having as many credit cards as possible, if it's personal as well as business credit cards. People are like, yo, if you have a credit card, chop it up, never use it, right? But I'm all about OPM and having access to lines of credit. So instead of me going out and raising a hundred thousand dollars, I'll rather spend one night in front of the computer and raise fifty to hundred thousand dollars, right, through credit cards. So with having this stack of credit cards, you know, people always get these things in the mail, right? They look like little blank checks 
from credit card companies. Most people, probably about 99.9% .9 of the people, they go ahead and put those things in the shredder. They rip them up a million pieces. They throw them away. But I said, you know, I'm low on my cash. I get, just gave this man $100,000 of my actual hard-earned cash, right, that I've been working for. And I said, you know what? I want to buy a house with one of these checks, right? They're coming to my door. I open them up. They say 0% interest for, for uh, 16 months. Usually it's anywhere between 12 to 16 months at the time. These were for 16 months, right? And then I'm looking at the, uh, I'm looking at the check. I was like, wow, I could just write this check out to myself. So I wrote it out to myself. $20,000 check, cashed it. It was in my account within two to three days, right? And there's this property that I was buying in Coatesville at the time for $25,000. So I used another balance transfer check to cover uh, the remaining costs of buying that property as well as fixing it up. So now I got a whole asset. I fixed it up all on this balance transfer check. And with this balance transfer check, you know, once I got it tenanted, you know, I got to pay back the, the credit card company because basically, and the reason to take, take a step back, the reason why these credit card these credit card companies give you balance transfer checks is because it's a way where they can cannibalize business from their competitors. So let's say, for instance, you have J.P. Morgan over here. You got Bank of America. Bank of America sends um, balance transfer checks to these J.P. Say if you got a new card with Bank of America. So Bank of America t sends you a balance transfer check because they want you to take your balance that you might have with J.P. Morgan and transfer it over to Bank of America. Yes, they'll give you that teaser rate for that 12 to 16 months, no interest, 0% interest, because after that 0% interest wears out, they're banking on the fact that you'll continue to pay Bank of America instead of J.P. Morgan. That's the way Bank of America is going to be able to steal customers from J.P. Morgan, right? So that's the whole principle of it. But me being in the in the finance world, I used to work at Bank of America and so forth, so I understand how credit cards work, how balance transfers work. So I said, you know what, I'm going to write this check out to myself. Got the checks. Then I'm purchasing this real estate all through the credit card. So once it's tenanted, I took that same property to a small bank out in Coatesville, right, Coatesville Savings Bank. And they were able to refine or they were able to put a mortgage on that property. So I took those funds that they gave me for the mortgage, and I paid off those credit cards. So now those credit cards are back to, to zero balance, right? But mind you, I did that whole process in about three months, and I got actually a cash surplus of $15,000, but I did that in three months, right? So these balance transfers were good for 16 months. So I still had another 13 months to tap in and use the, the access to these, to these cards at 0% interest. So then what did I do? I grabbed another property, right? And I kept doing this over and over again. And once I got close to that deadline, when that 16 months was rounding out, made sure I did the cash out refinance, paid those cards off. Then I just go ahead and get a new card, new set of cards, so that way they can go ahead and give me that 0% introductory rate again. But also what happens is, as you run through that balance transfer process and you end up paying those cards off, that same company is going to send you new balance transfer checks. So it's just crazy once you know how to play the game and you realize the importance of, you know, thinking outside the box, right? Most people, if you ask them, hey, can you buy a house on credit card? They're going to say, no way. How could you buy a house on credit card, right? And it's something as simple as the fact that, you know, you just simply have to know how to how to play the game, man. It's, it's, it's wild out here. It's wild. Gee, no one would ever think you could just buy a crib with a credit card, bro. No. Nah. Zero percent interest too. Yeah, zero percent interest. And the reason why I also like credit cards is because you're able to be in a situation where you're accumulating a massive amounts of points. Mm. And, and like, Let me hear about some points. Yeah, yep. So one of my favorite cards to use is this American Express Platinum card, right? You do have to have some, you know, pretty decent credit. Um, but the way I use my American Express uh, credit card is is very unique. So let's say, for instance, I'm buying a property that's undervalued, and I'm using something called hard money, a short term loan. A short-term loan, like I talked about earlier, is going to give me a large portion of the purchase price as a loan, right? Plus, they're going to give me 100% of the construction. But as I'm getting this construction done, typically, I have to go ahead and front the cost of that work. So I'll put that cost of the work on my platinum card. So let's say if I got a $100,000 project, I'll float $25,000 on the card. So once $25,000 of work is complete, then I'll call my lender to come take a look at the property. 
They say, okay, you, you've done $25,000 worth of work. They'll wire that $25,000 into my account. Now I take that $25,000 and I pay off my American Express card, right? But what I did was I just accumulated 25,000 points with American Express. Now I can use those points to travel, to eat. My wife likes to go eat. And I'm, I'm a, a very frugal guy, so you know, I'm not like, oh, man, we're going out to date night again. Now I figured out how to get the American Express card to cover the date night, and it's basically just for doing the cost of doing business, right? By me going up, fixing up properties, now we got date night twice, three times a week, all covered by American Express. We're able to travel because of American Express, right? We're able to book hotels and so forth because of these points that I'm accumulating. And imagine if you're in a situation where you have, um, say, 10 properties at a $100,000 budget, that's a million dollars that you're running through that Amex card, that American Express card. And American Express takes notice. They're like, man, this guy had a balance of $80,000 and he was able to pay it off. So what do they do? They increase your amount. So with increasing the amount, you know, I have, I think I'm able to spend uh, $225,000. It's probably more now because I've been running that card like crazy. But I'm able to spend $225,000 at any given time on my Amex card. Mm. So that's just, that's just a, a massive amount of points. So that's what I like about real estate is that you have to get creative, right? You got to think outside the box. And that's what, you know, I'm here just breaking down this knowledge for you so you guys can just kind of expand your mindset, expand your thinking. I don't know. I don't, I don't know if I should keep going because you've been going off, or should we just yeah. end this? I think yeah. part two was crazy. Yeah. Um. I think part two was crazy. So, um. Oh, let me see. Let me see if I could pull another question or two from you, man. Because I I just want to really see people win. So, we talked up a little bit about contractor. We talked about section eight. I know you just talk talk about how anybody can be approved for Section 8. Some people oh, think yeah. you got to pay for that. And uh, and talk about the recent deal. I think you got a tenant only got to oh, pay yeah. $25 a yeah, month. Yeah, yeah, uh, talk crazy. about that. Because somebody can get off this call yeah. and go get at least a plot for Section 8. I mean, to yeah. be able to, be to accept landlord. it yeah. before you even own a property. You guys, you don't have to own a property to be right. able to... What you say, always you got to stay ready so, so you don't have, have to get, get ready. ready. Yeah. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so definitely you got to stay ready before you have to get ready. But, yeah, anybody – so Section 8 is available in, all throughout the country, no matter where you are. You could be in Beverly Hills, there's Section 8. There's public assistance, right? There's you got to go to your housing authority. But you can become a landlord in the county that you want to invest in. Very simple. You just go to Google, type in your county's name, and type in housing authority, you know, a Section 8 landlord, and you'll be able to see what the qualifications are. But you can literally become a Section 8 landlord in a matter of an hour or two, right? But now you'll be able to be on the payroll, be on the government payroll. And they haven't missed a payment to me in, you know, the pandemic. They haven't missed a payment during, uh, you know, government shutdown. They haven't missed a payment during the recession. So you haven't missed a payment yet? I haven't missed a payment. So, so that's, a, that's in, the in the last ten years from section. The last ten years from section eight, man. So that's something every month. That, when it, on the first, on the fifth, uh, a lot of times the, the money actually doesn't hit the account till the third. Got it. So uh, right by the third, guaranteed, guaranteed, money's coming in. And what you tell me, it's a two year lease. Yep. So in Philadelphia, <laughs> it's a two year lease. Yep. So you're locking them in for two years. But uh, yeah, one of the properties that we just actually moved out of, because again, I don't sell the properties. People are like, yo, Doug, you, you and your wife are moving to a new house. Like, how can we just don't go ahead and sell that property? Why would I sell it? I put it on Section 8, and we're renting that property for $14.75. And the tenant is only paying $25 a month. So that $14.50, we're getting that straight from the government, Section 8, every 30 days. And we have systems in place where the tenant pays that $25 electronically. We're not going, chasing her down or anything like that. Mm. But the note, the mortgage on that property is only $800. So now we're able to receive that cash flow and get that nice asset that we fixed up, paid for by that tenant, and now they're going to cover that property all through, you know, for the next. They're not going anywhere, because <laughs> where would you go to live tw at twenty five dollars a month? I hear people talk about, there. What if they damage your property? What if they damage? <laughs> people don't know that, yo. They're not. You think somebody? Let me ask you this. You think somebody who paying twenty five dollars a month? Is going to risk losing their Section Eight voucher, which you, which is so hard to get right now. Right. I don't. You think somebody going to do that? Definitely not. 
That, why would they? At twenty five dollars a month, yo, you're gonna be on your best behavior. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> literally. I right. ain't, I don't want no smoke. You talking about free? What? Yeah. So talk about a contractor play. So a lot of people are under the impression when you talk about becoming your GC, I think oh, they yeah. think you in a crib actually literally ripping down beams, yeah. slapping spackle up on the walls. Oh, no, no. Uh, and I always like to tell people, yo, you got to get out of traditionalism thinking. Traditionalism mm. thinking that, hey, you in a box for the rest of your life, bro. Yeah, yeah. Talk about becoming yeah. a GC without lifting a hammer or a nail. Yeah, l- let me just break down the place. So being a general contractor is you know, not as hard as you think, but let me just give you a general contracting play, right? So let's say, for instance, let's just, fo- let's just not even focus on doing a whole house. Let's just focus on a small topic of being a general contractor so let's say for instance we want to be a flooring general contractor right a flooring subcontractor so let's say um i found i have some floor guys that'll do floors at a dollar a square foot so they'll go ahead and install floors at a dollar a square foot right but in most markets the going rate for installing floors is anywhere between two to four dollars a square foot So what happens if you go ahead on Craigslist, you put out an ad and say, hey, I do floor installations at $2 a square foot. That's actually at the bottom of the market. So people are going to contact you, say, hey, I need floors installed, right? So what you do is you contract your your flooring sub, right? My flooring guys happen to be Brazilian, and they work at $1 a square foot. So let's say you see a a job that's 1,000 square feet. You do the measurements. So you give your guy $1,000 for doing that job, right? And you have the customer pay you half up front, so you get $1,000 up front. That $1,000 is basically yours to cover the cost of doing that labor, right? And then once the floor is complete, you get that other $1,000. So the customer just gave you $2,000 for the install, right? So that install is $2,000. You charge them. You give your your, uh, your actual guy that's doing the labor, doing the work, $1,000. You get to keep a thousand dollars, right? But imagine if you are able to do about ten flooring jobs, ten flooring jobs a month, right? And the average flooring job might be a thousand square feet. So that right there is ten thousand dollars that you'll be able to do just by GCing that job, just by making the calls, putting the ad up on Craigslist, and saying, "Hey, I need you to uh, come and do some floors for me," right? So that's $10,000 that you can do by just doing 10 jobs of floors, which is very easy, especially if you advertise in your county, in your area, right? And you can scale up. You can get, imagine if you had two different crews that install floors. So now you might be able to do 20 jobs in a month with those two different crews. So now instead of making $10,000, you're making $20,000 a month simply by doing floors. But hey, we're not done there, right? Imagine if you're able to find where to get the floors for the low, (laughs) right? So I got a place, I get these luxury vinyl floors for $1.75 a square foot. Home Depot is selling them for about $3 a square foot, right? So now you can sell them to the customer, say, hey, I know Home Depot sells them for $3 a square foot. I can sell you these floors right here for $2.75 a square foot. So I'll shave off a quarter for you. Customers are like, oh wow, you'll shave off a quarter for me? Great, that's 15% or whatever on the savings. So now, you do 10,000 square feet of floors. I think you're going too hard. I'm going too uh, right, yeah, No, I, keep, no, keep, keep going. going. All right, I'll keep, keep, keep blessing keep the people. All right, Ooh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That yeah. boy going crazy. Listen, listen. Mm, so you mm, so you got, so you just got, so, so we're doing 10 jobs, right? 1,000 square feet. So you just got $10,000 from the labor. But now if you're able to get a dollar on the material, that's another $10,000. So now imagine just doing 10 jobs, flooring jobs. You got 10,000 coming in off the labor. Another $10,000 coming off the material. That's $20,000 just for focusing in and zeroing in on doing floors, floor installation. <laughs> All you're doing is running some ads. You can run ads on Instagram, Facebook, <laughs> Craigslist, <laughs> you know, just get good at Angie's ads. list. Angie's list. I mean, darn, you can put up flyers in the neighborhood. I do floors. Every flooring job, you can stat- put something right in the front yard. Get your floors done for the lowest in the city, <laughs> right? So now you have these floor jobs coming in. Making money on the material, dollar on the material, dollar on the labor. Ten <laughs> jobs, twenty thousand dollars. Twenty thousand wow. dollars times twelve. That's two hundred and forty thousand dollars you could tap into just by simply getting good at saying, "Hey, what's the square footage of your the property?" You need to have a degree to do that. 
No degree needed. You need to have a uh, skill. You not have to lay down floors. You don't even have to know how to lay down floors. You probably, could, I mean, it would be nice if you just watch a little YouTube video, maybe five minutes, just so you have a, a simple understanding of the jargon. <laughs> but other than that, all you need to do is just go find the guy that lays the floors down, get him down, and better, best yet, you're giving that floor guy that, that much business that he's going to lower his price. He's going to be like, hey, I'll do the install for you for 75% since you've been so good to me, Doug. <laughs> wow. Hey, guys, yeah. listen to this, man. Part two was fire. I told y'all I'm making sure I'm coming so crazy with season two, giving y'all guys all the game that y'all need. So I hope you guys really enjoyed this episode, man. This was absolutely game-changing. Doug really broke down so much. And, and, again, I know we're about to wrap it up. I didn't even realize our producers just told us we've been running over an hour already on this particular episode. I want to really give another 30 minutes, but maybe we might do a part three. But what I want y'all to do, um, if you're listening to this, go to Doug's page on Instagram, Doug Depp. And on, on his last comment, just say, podcast was fired. It, this actually lets me know if you listen to the entire episode. And again, I heard him say it, and he's crazy for it. He's giving away a house at some point in time. I think he said go to www.realestatewealthbook.com. I guess more details are going to be on there. Um, he's going to pick one of his mentees or students to be able to get a house. And to apply for mentorship, it's executewithdoug.com. And, guys, when you go ahead and do it, let me know if you do end up signing up or joining so I know. I'm like, yep, that's from the podcast. Um, but more importantly, y'all, make sure you take this information use it because this information is useless unless used. I'm watching – so many people lives change as a result of Doug's teachings. I'm watching so many people level up, right? I'm watching all my peers who we run with literally run the plays that he's breaking down here. So please utilize it. If you would like to leave anybody with any uh, words of wisdom or any uh, last words, Doug, as we bring this to a close today. I think the biggest thing is just don't give up, right? So don't give up and realize that the biggest room in the world is the room for improvement, mm. right? The biggest room in the world is the room for improvement. So keep going, keep making it happen, and let's get it. Let's get it, y'all. So again, make, make sure y'all continue to tap into Accelerate the Great. We're going to keep bringing y'all the best, and y'all, I dropped the secret. I'm dropping my, I, I'm, I'm dropping my album, y'all. The Road to Greatness. No one even knows about it yet, but when we drop this thing... Whew, 10 tracks. I think it's 10 tracks. The producer's wrapping it up right now. I cannot wait to share this with the world to really make, make you win at the top of this year. And uh, with that being said, I want to thank you all for tuning in. Um, thank you for tapping into Accelerate the Great. And I hope you use this information to allow you to grow, get to the next level and win. So without further ado, y'all, your boy is out. Peace.